Imagine a predator with serrated teeth, armored skin and venom in its bite. A reptile so powerful it can take down animals five times its weight. Built like a tank, the Komodo dragon is the largest lizard on earth and one of nature's most efficient killing machines. In this video, we take a closer look at an animal that's both ancient and surprisingly modern. If you enjoy stories like this, consider liking the video and subscribing. It helps the channel grow and brings more wild stuff to curious minds like yours. On a few small islands in Indonesia, the last of the dragons still roam. These islands are dry, rugged and seasonal. Steep hills roll into savannas, with patches of monsoon forest tucked between valleys. Unlike the dense jungles of Sumatra or Borneo, these landscapes are open, sun-baked and quiet. For most of the year there is barely any rain. The air is dry, the ground cracked, the trees sparse. It's not an easy place to live, but for a reptile built for heat, solitude and patience, it's perfect. Komodo dragons belong to a powerful lineage, the monitor lizards or Varanidae. A full-grown dragon can reach around 2.5 meters in length and weigh more than 70 kilograms. The largest verified wild Komodo dragon measured 3.04 meters in length. Larger individuals have been recorded in captivity, but these rarely represent true wild size. They look like something that has been walking the planet for a very long time, like a living dinosaur. Their ancestors likely evolved in Australia and spread westward through island chains over a million years ago. Fossil evidence from Flores shows they've been present there for at least 1.4 million years, including teeth, bones and even well-preserved limb fragments. But their family tree goes even further. In prehistoric Australia, they shared their range with a cousin that dwarfed even them. Megalania varanus priscus, the largest lizard to ever live. Estimates suggest it reached up to 7 meters in length and weighed over 600 kilos. It may have hunted giant marsupials, but when Australia's megafauna vanished, Megalania disappeared with it. The Komodo dragon, however, survived likely by migrating west through what is now Indonesia. With no large mammalian carnivores to compete with, they retained their large size, a trait they evolved in prehistoric Australia. On the islands, their dominance continued due to a lack of competing predators. The dragons adapted quickly, evolving into ambush hunters capable of taking down whatever the ecosystem offered. Today, Komodo dragons are found only on five islands – Komodo, Rinka, Gili Motang, Gili Dasami and parts of Flores. It's a fragment of their former range, but it's enough to keep the dragon alive. Everything about the Komodo dragon's body is made for power. Thick, muscular limbs carry a body that can weigh over 70 kilos. They walk with a low, swaying gait. But don't be fooled. In short bursts, they can sprint up to 20 km per hour. Their tail is a multi-purpose tool, a counterweight in motion, a stabilizer during strikes and a weapon in combat. Their head is broad and heavy, equipped with a powerful jaw and over 60 serrated teeth. Each one measures about 2.5 cm. Each tooth is laterally compressed, curved and designed to tear rather than chew, like a natural steak knife. These teeth are coated in iron-rich enamel, giving them durability and a dark coloration. And like sharks, Komodos regularly shed and replace their teeth, staying armed and ready for every kill. Their skin is armor-plated, literally. Underneath the scales lie osteoderms, tiny bony plates that act like natural chainmail. These develop with age, making older dragons appear rugged, cracked, almost fossilized. Young dragons don't have this armor, a vulnerability that shapes their entire behavior. Their primary hunting sense isn't sight or hearing. 
its chemical detection. Using their long forked tongue and Jacobson's organ in the roof of their mouth, they sample air particles and smell prey. This system is so sensitive, it can detect blood or carrion from up to 9 kilometers away, depending on wind and terrain. In rare cases, Komodo dragons have attacked humans, usually when surprised, threatened or fed by hand. Such incidents are uncommon, but they do happen. And underneath all of this, a metabolism that's unusually high for a reptile. Although Komodos are cold-blooded, their basal metabolic rate is elevated compared to other lizards. It allows for faster digestion, quicker movements and sustained patrols, all vital for a top predator. But what truly sets them apart isn't just anatomy, it's behavior. Some Komodo dragons have been observed returning to successful ambush spots, adjusting position based on wind direction or altering hunting times depending on human activity. In captivity, individuals have demonstrated problem-solving skills, including opening enclosure gates and reacting differently to familiar versus unfamiliar handlers. While their brain is small, it's structured differently from that of most lizards. With expanded areas for sensory processing, they're not just instinct machines. There's calculation in what they do. And when they strike, they lunge low, aiming for vital spots like the legs, abdomen or throat. The initial blow alone can shatter bones or rupture organs, but the real damage continues under the skin. For decades, Komodo dragons were said to kill with filthy mouths. The myth their teeth were so coated in bacteria that a single bite caused sepsis and death. It made for a dramatic story, but modern science tells a different one. For a long time, no one seriously looked for venom. The bacteria theory stuck, and the tools to prove otherwise just didn't exist. That changed in 2009, when biologist Brian Fry and his team used MRI scans to reveal something no one had seen before. Venom glands in the jaw, fully functional and chemically active. These glands secrete a cocktail of proteins that disrupt blood pressure, inhibit clotting and induce shock. Among them, phospholipase A2, crisp proteins and natriuretic peptides, some of which are also found in viper venom. When a Komodo bites, it delivers not just trauma, but chemical sabotage. Blood flows freely, arteries don't constrict, blood pressure drops. In some cases, the effect is so strong that the prey collapses almost instantly from circulatory shock, before blood loss becomes fatal. This is not a neurotoxic kill like in cobras. It's a cardiovascular takedown, silent, internal, devastating. The bite also introduces large amounts of saliva, which remains rich in bacterial diversity. Not enough to kill, but enough to cause infection in untreated wounds. It's not the weapon, but it adds to the danger. The venom is the main chemical tool, the trauma is the main physical one. Together, they form an incredible lethal bite. Komodo dragons rarely chase. They wait. They lie in tall grass behind rocks or under dry leaf cover, perfectly still. When the moment comes, they explode forward in a low, forceful lunge. Common prey includes Timor deer, wild pigs, monkeys, goats and even water buffalo. Although large prey like buffalo can take hours to succumb and may require multiple dragons. If the animal flees, the dragon follows, not with speed, but with persistence. Their sense of smell can trace a blood trail over great distances. Despite hunting alone, Komodos feed communally. At a kill site, the largest male eats first. Dominance is everything, and it's enforced with violent authority. Smaller dragons are pushed aside, some wait, some fight. And if one gets too close, it may become the next meal. Cannibalism is common, making up to 10% of their diet. It's brutal, but on islands with limited food, it's efficient. 
Komodo dragons interact socially, even beyond feeding. Some individuals display territorial behavior, regularly patrolling the same areas and showing aggression toward intruders. They communicate with body language, posture and tail movement, and possibly even through scent markings or fecal trails. There's hierarchy, memory, competition. In a landscape with limited resources, dragons remember. Young dragons know this, that's why they flee to the trees. They spend their early years in the canopy, feeding on geckos, insects and birds. They only descend once they've grown large enough to defend themselves. To avoid being eaten, juveniles sometimes go even further. They roll in feces and carrion, masking their scent and mimicking the smell of rot, a form of chemical camouflage against hungry adults. A full-grown Komodo can eat up to 80% of its body weight in a single sitting. To handle such a feast, they have a breathing tube under the tongue, allowing them to swallow while still breathing. If a carcass is too big, they slam it against rocks or trees to break it down. Even their stomach acid is adapted, strong enough to dissolve most bones. Indigestible parts like hair and horn are regurgitated later in compact pellets. In the dry season, male dragons compete for mates. They wrestle upright on their hind legs, grappling and slamming into each other like reptilian sumo wrestlers. The larger male usually wins, but mating isn't guaranteed. Females are smaller, but often resist advances with bites and claw swipes. Only after a rough courtship do they allow copulation. Females lay up to 30 eggs, often in abandoned, orange-footed, scrub fowl mounds. To protect them, she may dig decoy nests nearby to confuse predators, and sometimes guards the real nest for weeks or even months without feeding. After seven to eight months, usually timed with the rainy season, the eggs hatch. Hatchlings are about 40 centimeters long, slender and agile. They emerge with camouflage stripes and climbing instincts. Within hours, they are scrambling up trees to avoid ground predators, including their own mother. Most won't survive. Estimates suggest only a small percentage make it to adulthood. But those who do will grow steadily over the next decade. By age 8 or 9, they reach sexual maturity. Males grow larger, live longer and dominate breeding. Females have shorter lifespans, investing their energy into egg production and defense. And in rare cases, a female can reproduce without a male. Through parthenogenesis, she can lay viable eggs that develop into all-male offspring. This process involves meiotic automixes, where the egg's own genetic material doubles to form a complete set of chromosomes. It's a genetic emergency switch, a way to restart a population from a single individual. It's rare in reptiles, but in Komodo dragons it works. By day, they retreat to cool burrows or shaded spots to escape the tropical heat. At dawn and dusk, they are active, patrolling trails, crossing riverbeds, stalking prey. They are also strong swimmers, using lateral body undulations to paddle across channels. Sightings confirm they can cross several kilometers of open water, allowing gene flow between island populations. But their world is shrinking. They are already extinct on Pada Island, likely due to habitat loss and human activity. On Flores, their range is fragmented by agriculture, roads and settlements. Today, there are an estimated only about 1,400 adult Komodo dragons remain in the wild. Fewer than 5,000, including juveniles. Outside the park, populations are in decline. And now a new threat looms, climate change. Studies predict that rising temperatures and sea levels could wipe out up to 70% of suitable Komodo habitat by 2050. Their island ecosystems are vulnerable. Komodo dragons can't migrate to new regions. 
If their habitat disappears, so do they. But it's not just about saving a species. Komodo dragons play a vital ecological role. They control prey populations, clean up carrion and shape the balance of island food webs. Without them, the ecosystem tips. The whole system changes. Efforts are ongoing. Ranger patrols, nesting site protection and restricted tourism zones help limit pressure. But survival depends on more than rules and borders. It requires long-term habitat protection, community involvement and global awareness. Komodo dragons are not echoes of the past. They are fully adapted to the present. Precise, efficient and shaped by their environment. Their survival depends on a balance that is now shifting. Small islands, limited range, rising threats. But they're still here, still hunting, breeding and holding their place in a fragile ecosystem. The future is uncertain, but as long as these islands stay wild, so do they. Thanks for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Stay curious and keep exploring.